Ladies and gentlemen, this is Fangs Kill. Please welcome, from the Conservative Partnership Institute, Rachel Bovard. From the Federalist, Sean Davis. And your host, from Oklahoma, U.S. Senator James Lankford. Good Sunday morning, everybody. It's the Lord's Day. Great to be able to see everybody here. I'm James Langford from Oklahoma. I'm Eve from Oklahoma here. There's a few of us scattered around here, so hopefully everybody can sing the song, Oklahoma. And uh, you're ready to be able to take that on. You want to introduce yourself real quick as well? Well, good morning. I'm Rachel Bovard. I am the Senior Director of Policy at Jim DeMint's Conservative Partnership Institute. And I'm also the tech columnist for The Federalist. <laughs> Hi there, my name is Sean Davis. I'm co-founder of The Federalist. Thrilled to have uh, <laughs> Rachel on board. She's such a great voice uh, for sanity and tech policy. And also great to have uh, Senator Lankford here. Uh, it's good to know we have allies in Congress when it comes to regulating big tech. So I think uh, everyone here probably agrees woke big tech is a cancer on the country and it's gonna crush our country if we don't destroy them. These are not nice actors just freely operating in a free market. These are hostile, monopolistic actors looking to crush us. Uh, my company, The Federalist, uh, tried to be canceled by Google. Google worked together with NBC News. They worked with a foreign NGO to try and shut us down and demonetize us because we criticized the media's coverage of the BLM violent riots which is, it's shocking, right. it's shocking. Um, so I think the debate we have here before us, it, it's not so much anymore whether woke big tech is good or bad. I think the verdict uh, is in on that. These are bad actors that are gonna tear down this country. Uh, they would, if they, if they had the ability today, they would cancel each one of us, they would keep, cancel each one of you and everyone watching. And so the debate now isn't whether woke big tech is bad, the debate is not on whether they need to be crushed. The debate is on what we're gonna do about it. And I know, Senator, you've got some ideas. I do, and there's a lot that's out there and everybody's seen it. it for me, the wake up moment was several years ago, I was actually in Silicon Valley, was meeting with some different tech executives there, and in just a private conversation in the hallway, I made the comment to somebody about his children and what, what do they do at their household, and he immediately responded back, oh, I don't let my kids get on any of the social media at all. And here's a Silicon Valley exec like, oh no, I would never, never let my family actually do this. And I've started asking different tech folks since then when I meet them, what do you do with your family? And most of them say, oh no, I don't let them on the platforms. They understand exactly what they're delivering and what they're doing. And we understand what this looks like in real censorship. But let me remind everybody what we're really talking about. So let me show you some of these things. Uh, this group all knows that Donald Trump was banned from Twitter, right? <clears throat> that was pretty obvious, but who does Twitter allow to be able to be on there still? Donald Trump is still banned. The Chinese government is still on Twitter. Let me show you several others. They're still on Twitter. Let's go to the next one. So, the, in fact, the Chinese government organizations, even outside like the embassy in Pakistan, they're still on. Nicolas Maduro. Now, Maduro is the unrightful head of, Venez of Venezuela. Okay, he's not recognized by most countries. He's actually led to an overthrow of his own country and a domination. He's still on Twitter. Donald Trump is not. Let's keep going through this. Okay, Hezbollah, uh, Hamas, they're on Twitter. They're such a nice NGO, aren't they? <laughs> so there's Hamas, they're on Twitter still. Donald Trump is blocked. Who else? You can go back to uh, uh, Daniel Ortega, who just literally went through and did a fraudulent election. In every way, every international entity recognizes a fraudulent election there. He is actually on Twitter still, Donald Trump is not. Then you've got Erdogan. Erdogan from Turkey, who has brutalized his own people, who has literally locked up every journalist in his country, every educator in his country, and has fought vehemently imprisoning people in his own country. He is still actually out there, Donald Trump is not. Let's keep going. You can go through Cuba and those, those leaders, great, nice people in Cuba. How about the Ayatollah in trying to be able to lead through what's happening in Iran? 
still on Twitter. How about the uh, former president of Russia here, Medvedev, still on Twitter as they're attacking Ukraine, still out there. Let me go through several others here. The uh, Kremlin official site is still out there while current violence is happening right now in Ukraine. The Kremlin is still able to put out all their propaganda via Twitter. So let me talk a little different subject here on it. So th this is what's happened with Google. There's something called live action. If any of y'all familiar with live action, amazing work that they do uh, on exposing lots of different areas. Live action is putting out information because right now the biggest push on abortion is abortion pills. It's chemical abortions where they literally mail order people in abortion. So multiple entities are promoting chemical abortions and how you can be mailed this stuff. Live action is also saying if you take the first pill in this, there is a way to reverse that and actually save the life of the child. So live action is putting out the information saying here's how to save your child if you choose to do that. Google is allowing the ads to be able to get an abortion but not allowing the ads to be able to save the life of the child. So if you want to take the life of your child, you can run that ad. If you want to protect the life of your child, you cannot. Let's move on to the next. There's several in a row. Let's go to two more. Thank you very much. So Life News, the same thing. GoDaddy has blocked out Texas right to life, but they're allowing NARAL. So this is a website that's out there. If, again, if you want to have abortion or promote abortion, you can do that. If you want to actually protect the values and the life of children, you can't do that. Let's go to the next. Gets even more interesting. Everybody knows what uh, the tech entities did to Parler. Within 48 hours, they decided they didn't like Parler, and they worked across multiple platforms, including Amazon Web Services, others, where they actually pulled Parler down. Take the subjective nature of uh, Apple. Apple and their apps platform, as they talk about objectionable content, any content they can take down, also includes, as you'll see highlighted here, things that people in Silicon Valley at Apple consider just plain creepy. If you do something just plain creepy, then they can actually take you off their platform. Let's go to the next one. This is a really interesting one for Facebook. This is a new one that we're just starting to be able to push out you might not have heard of yet. Facebook says it's that it's against their rules to promote anything unlawful. That should make sense. If you're gonna promote something unlawful, you can't do that, except, except if it's illegally crossing our southern border. They will help you facilitate illegally crossing our southern border. That includes individuals reaching out to human smugglers. Now this is directly from Meta itself, from Facebook, to say if people are reaching out to human smugglers, and want to get in contact with them to be able to illegally cross the border, that is allowable under Facebook rules, but everything else they say illegal is not allowable. If you ever want to get into context what we're really up against, this is the kind of stuff that we're up against. It's completely subjective. It's what they feel like at the moment. It allows one group to be able to speak out on a constitutional protected speech and another group to just be ignored or wiped out or blocked. So I want to talk about an aspect of this debate. Well, and thank you, Senator, for pointing all of that out. So when we think about everything Senator Langford just presented, why are these companies so powerful? What is it that gives them this massive control over speech and over the market? It's market concentration. And I want you to think for a moment, because we think about a lot of these platforms as speech platforms, and they are. We just had some great examples of how but they're also market access platforms. And this doesn't get enough attention among conservatives, and I hope that it does, because if you are a small business in this country, to reach the mainstream market, you have to go through one of these platforms. If you're an app, if you're a parlor, if you are Truth Social, you have to go through Apple, and you have to go through Google. And we've just seen what Apple thinks is reasonable content, and it's not what a lot of us think. And so when we address this problem from a comprehensive standpoint, we have to acknowledge there is no free market in tech. We have to solve that problem before any of our alternative platforms can succeed. And so when our lawmakers say break them up, we need to hold them accountable to say yes, break them up because we want the free market to work in tech. We do not want to be ruled by monopolists who are changing our culture, who are changing our politics, who are changing the way we search for information. Consider that Google filters information for 90% of the world. Whatever Google decides to suppress or amplify is what you see. Do you think that that can have an impact on elections? I sure do. 
If you are a small business owner and Facebook shuts you off, you are like all of those conservative small businesses that I hear from every week saying, I can't access the market. I've lost all the data on all you know, the people that were coming to my site just because Facebook decided something was too creepy. And you, you don't want to know what they decide is too creepy? A book publisher that was publishing books about Amy Coney Barrett and Ronald Reagan. Right? A conservative clothing outlet. Nope, too creepy. Might promote the Second Amendment. So we really do need to get a handle on this market concentration problem, and we need to do that through targeted antitrust enforcement. Now, I hear a lot of times conservatives say, well, that's regulation. It's not regulation. Antitrust is law enforcement for the marketplace. Right. Conservatives support law enforcement in every other area. We need to support it in the market. We need to protect the free market so our small businesses can succeed, so our small competitors like Parler don't get wiped off the map because Jack Dorsey wants it to be that way. Okay, so we need to, this is the way you support the market is you support antitrust enforcement. Now, one other thing I want to mention uh, is I work in Washington, D.C., and I want to emphasize the David versus Goliath nature of this fight. Because these companies last year spent $65 million trying to buy the rules that govern them by lobbying Capitol Hill. The year after, they spent $70 million. This is three times what they spent a decade ago. And it is for one purpose, to protect themselves and, and sort of mess up everybody else. They think they get to decide what our self-government does to them, okay? And there's another thing that they're doing, and they have infected a lot of the conservative movement with their, money, with their dollars. There is money flowing all over Washington, and I want to tell you the way you figure it out is to, if you use a Chrome browser, if you use a Google browser, download an application called Big Tech Funding. Then open up your Twitter account, and you will see, it will show you everybody who's taking money from these big tech firms. Because again, they have one goal, and it is to control speech, it is to control the market, it is to control the government, and it is to control you. We don't want to put up with that anymore. We need to take aggressive policy steps to show them who's in charge. It's not Google, it's not Apple, it's not Facebook, it's not Amazon, it's us. In a self-government, we are the ones that rule. The big tech companies don't rule us. Right, man. So, Sean, solve it for us. <laughs> Well, so I, I think the first thing we have to do is recognize that there actually is a role for laws and government here. Right. Um, we, we hear so often, oh, it's not conservative. We, we, conservatives believe in the free market. They don't believe in regulation. We don't have a free market here. So look at Google. And I like to use the analogy, imagine that you had a company uh, that made all the cars. <clears throat> this company also makes all the tires. It also extracts all of the oil out of the ground. It refines it, sends it to the gas stations, which it also owns. And the same company, in addition to owning all the engines and the cars and the tires and the gas, also owns all the roads. And what happens at that point, just like what Google does, it gets to control where you go and how you get there. And imagine if we had one company in charge of all those saying, you know what, we're fine if you go to the liquor store, but you're not going to church. And that private school, you're not going there. Oh, and you want to go to a, a Republican Party meeting, you're not going there either. That's what we have. So, it's, so the first thing we have to do to fix it is realize that these are hostile monopolies that are using their market power uh, to crush dissent, to crush political speech, and to bring about political outcomes that they want through their censorship. If you go on Google and you use their autocomplete, you can go there and, and type in uh, censorship, and you will start seeing it autofill in, censorship is good. Censorship is fine. Censorship isn't bad. The, the first thing we have to do to fix this problem is understand that there is a role for government, for laws, for regulation to fix this so that we actually have free markets, actually have a free private sector so people can freely speak. So there's, there's several areas that we've got to be able to take on here. Both of you all have brought up the issue of the free market, and that's the issue of antitrust. Uh, that's Department of Justice actually stepping up and doing their job, spending more time working on breaking up all these big tech companies than they are attacking parents at school board meetings. That would be helpful. <laughs> uh, so that, that, that's one piece of this. The, the second piece of this deals with Section 230, which we've talked about a lot. We haven't talked about here very much on it, but it's been out there a lot. Section 230, we need to rip it out and, and start all over again Absolutely. on this. The, the Section 230 was created in the earliest days 
of the internet to be able to make sure that we could go after child porn, that we go after those things, that if there, any of those entities show up, we have the opportunity to be able to get those things out, and then we encourage those companies, and in fact, require those companies to be able to get it. Now it's become a shield that they hide behind in the process, and it has to be addressed. Now, we have to still deal with things like the child pornography. There are bad people out there putting really horrible, horrible stuff out there. We just used the Section 230 piece a couple of years ago to deal with a group called Backpage. Backpage was online literally sex trafficking children through their site saying, not our problem, not our problem, when it was clearly that's what the whole thing was designed to do was to be able to traffic children into, into sexual, uh, all, all kinds of horrible stuff. So there is a need to be able to have some of those things out there, but we've got to be able to have real legislative pieces that they can't come through and say, this is constitutionally protected speech, but I think it's creepy. This is constitutionally protected speech, uh, but I don't like this particular version of it. Or this is illegal activity, but I'm going to look the other way when it's illegal activity in China because I want to be able to sell to a billion people in China, but then I'm going to promote illegal activity across the border. So we've got to be able to zero in on that law itself. Yeah, a couple things I want to say about Section 230. So for a lot of conservatives, I, I debate these issues across Washington, and they say, well, why would you want the, the government involved? Section 230 is the government, <laughs> OK? <laughs> Section 230 was created in a law passed by Congress in 1996. It is big tech's government subsidy. Now, it, it acts across the internet, but these big, biggest platforms, they benefit from it more than anyone else. So the government has a controlling interest in going in and saying, that law we passed, we should re-examine it and update it. We do this all the time. Conservatives support this type of behavior. Right. The second thing I want to say about Section 230 is Senator Langford is absolutely right. These companies use Section 230 as a bulletproof shield to allow children to be trafficked into sex slavery. Facebook, last year, argued in the Supreme Court of Texas, oh, we knew that 14 and 15-year-old girls were being trafficked on Instagram, but it wasn't our problem. We knew that their mothers contacted us even after one of them was rescued and was still being pimped out on Instagram. We know that she contacted us, but uh, it just must have gotten lost. It's nothing that we're supposed to do because we're protected by Section 230. That was never the intent of the law. It needs to be updated and it needs to be changed. Yep. Well, the major reason for that is what the courts have done to it. Yeah. If you read Section 230, it's pretty clear. What they were trying to do was make sure that ISPs, that we're kind of at the beginning of the internet when this is written. Internet service providers yep. for everybody yep. else. Okay. AOL, you yep. know, however, your, your Comcast or whatever, that they weren't going to be held responsible for what you, a user, said on the internet. So it was targeted towards ISPs, but it wanted to give them the ability to go after illegal people, child traffickers, drug traffickers, and all that. And instead, what we've had the court do is turn this thing into a complete liability shield, a complete a get out of jail free card for tech. And the only way you fix a law that has been completely perverted by the courts is by going in, rewriting the law, and making clear to the courts who don't like to have limits imposed on them <laughs> that, sorry, limits are coming. Yep, rip and replace. Yep. That's what you've got to be able to do at this point to be able to make sure that you keep this clear. Let me, let me raise one other quick issue just to bring an awareness to you. Some of these free apps that you download, if you go through the long I accept language that's there and actually read through it, you'll find out that they're actually using your microphone and your camera and your GPS location and your contacts and your information to be able to actually be the resource. So that game may be free to you, but you should ask the simple question, who's the developer of this game? Who's actually funding this game? And where does my data go? Because you will find that you'll be in conversation sometimes with somebody in a group, and then you'll open up your phone next, and then you'll see an ad for the product that you just discussed. You know why that is? Because they have your microphone open, tracking what you talk about to then press ads to you on those issues. So I can't caution you enough. When we're dealing with tech in those free games that are out there, they are funded somehow, and often it is based off your information is how they actually get it, then sell it, and that's an area we have got to address yep. is getting access to people's microphones, their cameras, their contacts, and to be able to make sure we actually protect consumers in this. And this is why Section 230 reform is necessary, but not sufficient, because to take on this problem in totality, you need Section 230 reform, you need data privacy reform, yep. you need antitrust enforcement. So be wary of anyone telling you there's one silver bullet because there's not. We need a whole comprehensive policy approach to get these companies under control.
Yep. Yep, and it probably actually needs to be more than just a federal thing. There, there, are, there are avenues here for state lawmakers, state legislatures right. to come in and say, you know what, if you want to operate here, you're going to have to stop stealing people's data. Yeah. You're going to have to stop selling it. Because the thing is, if you've got a product and it's free, you're the product. <laughs> they are selling you. They are selling your information. It's not free. You're paying for it with all your privacy. So what to do on this? We encourage you to stay in contact with state legislators, with your state attorney general, because they have authority to be able to deal with some of these issues. Stay in contact with legislators. Let's rip out and replace 230. Let's actually get enforcement uh, with our U.S. attorney general in the areas he should actually be enforcing on all these antitrust suits, and then let's take on data privacy. But let's keep this conversation going and not like drift off and not say, gosh, they got a big part of the market. There's nothing we can do about it. We've got to open up the competition. Y'all, thanks. It's great to, Thank you. to be able to sit and visit with y'all today. Thank you. Thanks, Thank y'all, for staying engaged. Okay.